Welcome to the Tuesday edition of Wines World and welcome to the month of May. Uh, Sunday was May 1st, a very significant day pretty much worldwide um, in most of Asia and most of Latin America. It's um, Labor Day, International Labor Day, something like that. Um, it's certainly true in China. Um, in Italy, it's Workers' Day associated also with um, Jesus' father Joseph. It's uh, like it's St. Joseph's Day and it's also called Joseph the Worker Day. Uh, in Celtic countries, it's Beltane. Uh, Beltane is uh, one of the uh, signals of the changes of season, um, the introduction of spring, and in a similar vein in Anglo-Saxon communities, May 1st is May Day and is associated with things like maypoles and um, um, May customs which have been kind of perverted over the years and it's something that I've done a lot of writing about because um, when I was an undergraduate uh, at Oxford University, the Oxford University Morris men used to go to Magdalen Bridge where at dawn the choir of Magdalen College would sing a hymn to May at the top of the tower. And it was a it was a very strange event. I mean, like there were thousands and thousands of people there. Everyone gathered, and you couldn't hear anything. I mean, there was there's a full choir, but they're singing a cappella at the top of the tower, and you just vaguely hear this, you know, in the distance, and. And then at some point they stop and you can see the choristers looking over the tower uh, down onto the people below. And that was the signal for the Morris dancers to start processing up the high street um, with music. I, I used to play um, with, with the dancers and we would progress up the high street. Back in my day, uh, there were some dancers from the uh, Cecil Sharp Club who used to do country dancing up the uh, the street, but that doesn't happen anymore. Um, the, but the Morris dancers go up to uh, Radcliffe Square where they perform a dance around what's called the Jack in the Green. The Jack in the Green is a very old custom um, of a it's a, it's a man like completely decked out in in fresh greenery and uh and they do a dance around him at uh, uh Radcliffe uh square called at the dance is called Bonnie Green has nothing to do with the Jack and the Green tradition um and then they dance at the Bodley Inn they dance at St John's College and so forth and and for a long time, that was a custom that was unique to uh, Oxford. And then when I was squire of the university side, uh, we had um, a, a member of the um, team from the United States called Pinewoods uh, came over and stayed with us for a year. His name was Roger Cartwright. And he really liked the dancing at dawn thing and so he took it back to the United States and he introduced it to dancers in Boston in Massachusetts and they started doing it and it caught on and it, it, it now so now all over the world uh, um, at dawn on May 1st uh, Morris dancers go up to some uh, you know, <laughs> high pla you know, windy place or or you know, some sort of desolate place and perform to an audience of none. Uh, I'm just really a ridiculous modern custom. But in Oxford, it was just jam-packed, thousands and thousands of people. I mean, for Morris dancing, it was unheard of. You know, I used to dance when I was a teenager 
and we had audiences but they would be you know 10 20, 20 people would be a great audience I remember dancing on the steps of the Bodleian in 1970 where we must have had easily 3,000 people watching us <laughs> it's just extraordinary and so like this so May has arrived and um, and so this we're, we're still progressing uh, steadily towards Pentecost and uh, we'll have to work our way through May and I'm going to digress a little bit uh, probably do some cooking not going to do any today because I've I've got still too much to eat from uh, from Easter and and beyond I'm slowly unpacking not Easter I'm unpacking my freezer I want to get all the stuff that I've frozen out and and then I'll replace it with new things which is you know kind of what unpacking is about is about getting rid of the old and in with the new but what I've been thinking about in the last week or so is the concept of memory and that's really what I want to talk a little bit about today Now when I um, am working on my um, anthropological uh, writing, uh, memory is often something that comes up um, and it, like consciousness and like a lot of other abstractions, it's really hard to pin down but it's very important. <laughs> Just like consciousness itself, uh, like Descartes um, of course mused about it like how do I know I exist um, I know I exist because I'm able to reflect um, often translated as I think therefore I am but the actual Latin term is cogito ergo sum I ponder you know I have consciousness therefore I am well an important perhaps even like fundamental part of pondering is memory and when we are working on just about anything in our lives whether it's something profound or just something part of our daily lives we're relying on memory we rely on memory all the time first and foremost we rely on memory for speaking that is we have to remember what words mean we have to remember words we have to remember grammar we don't consciously most of the time remember those things like now and again we can't remember the word for something you have to like just what's is that word but most of the time we can just talk and um, the meanings come out uh, if we learn a new language we have we have to d <laughs> exercise a lot of memory because we have to remember new words new grammar and so forth so like right at the very heart of our being is our memory and if we lose our memory if we have some um, brain malfunction uh, like maybe have a stroke uh, and and lose certain parts of our memory then in a sense we're a different person we, we are what we present ourselves to the world in a certain way we react in certain ways like um, if if we have certain memories from childhood that uh, continue into adulthood it will affect the way we respond to certain things I mean I was watching a movie the other day 
which I had to turn off. And I had to turn it off because it was triggering memories that I don't like. Um, I'm, I'm sure it was a perfectly good movie and I was, it seemed to be well enough constructed and I'm sure a lot of people will like it. I just couldn't watch it because of the memories it was sparking in me. Uh, there was a long period in my life where memories from my upbringing, my, my extended childhood if you like, that is my, my years through um, uh, infancy to adolescence, would plague me. <laughs> and I, I would just constantly be reminded of certain things that happened in my childhood. I didn't realize until quite recently that this is because I, I have a certain kind of memory called eidetic memory. That is, I can remember certain events in my past with absolute crystal clarity. I can quite literally see the events happening and I can recall verbatim things that people have said. I thought everyone could do that. <laughs> I didn't realize that it's not something that everyone can do. In fact, I mean, some people have very, very poor memories. They can't, I mean, like, well, I can't always remember what I had for breakfast. But there are some people who just can't, they, they can't remember the things from childhood. I'll, 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 I'll go up to them and say, do you remember when we, you know, and I'm talking about something that happened when we were in our 20s or something. And they'll say, nope, it's gone. And, and for them, it doesn't matter. Where for me, those memories not only matter, they kind of like pervade my consciousness. And <laughs> one of the solutions I found quite a, quite a number of years ago now, talking about 40 years ago, I found out that the best way to uh, exorcise those memories was to write about them, to write down um, th those experiences. And uh, I ended up writing a whole autobiography of my years growing up in Australia. And you know, lo and behold, they went away. I mean, they don't, didn't go away completely. I mean, I can still recall everything, but they're not plaguing me. Uh, somehow or other, writing them down, um, at least push them out of my current consciousness, uh, which is remarkable. And it's also remarkable that people who cannot read and write, that people who are illiterate, have extraordinary memories because they have to have uh, a, a repository of, of their knowledge and uh, daily understanding and they can't remember by writing things down <laughs> they don't have that capacity so they have to they have to remember and and it's well understood that people who live in illiterate s cultures have much much better memories than people who live in literate ones so we can also think of this as being a disadvantage that is, if you have the capacity to write things down, you have a less efficient memory and you may not remember things and you also may not write them down. <laughs> so you lose on both accounts, it's lose-lose. Uh, <laughs> kind of reminds me that I keep a shopping list by my desk and I write down the things that I need when I'm going to go to the supermarket because I know that when I go to the supermarket, I'm going to go forget something if I don't write it down. <laughs> and, then, and the sad irony is that about, you know, one time in 10, I will forget to take my list with me. So I have to like uh, recreate it. And most of the time, if I don't have my list with me, I will forget at least one thing. So having an eidetic memory does not it's not like having a photographic memory, which really doesn't exist, or, or having a perfect memory, which does exist among some people. There are very, very few people who can remember literally everything. If you give them a date, you know, you say, okay, um, May 2nd, 2002, they will tell you 
what they had for breakfast on that day. They know everything. They, they don't forget anything. And, and as it turns out, their lives are generally miserable because they can't forget anything. Like, when you think about the, um, uh, the adage, like, forgive and forget, you know, like, part of forgiveness is forgetting. Like, you did this thing that was really bad and I, it really upset me. I've forgiven you and one of the ways that you can know that I have forgiven you is that I've forgotten it. I don't keep bringing it up. I don't keep harping on something that is in the past. A very important part of relationships. <laughs> one of the things I know very well that if you're going to be arguing constantly with your partner, that one of the worst things that you can do is to bring up the past. You know, you always do this. Uh, you did this last year. You, you ten years ago, you forgot my birthday, and uh, you know, and so on. Like, memory isn't always a good thing. Um, you know, I mean, if you if you do remember your partner's birthday and your anniversary and all those kinds of things, and you remember. Uh, the things that they like, a particular flower or a scent or something like that, then that's, you know, like, that's good. <laughs> Remembering the bad things is not so good. So, um, I would be inclined to say that one of the ways I can define who I am or who you are is a collection of my memories of me like I am, I, I am that, that totality. And that's also the way that you can define a culture. Because not only do people have memories, so do cultures. And there are things that are part of a cultural memory that are pretty well permanent. Uh, and I'm writing a book right now about English culture and, and the memories of the culture are very important. I, I'm thinking about, for example, of all the kings and queens of England, which ones are p part of cultural memory and which ones aren't? And I would say, for example, that Henry VIII is in the cultural memory. Not very deeply. Don't know a lot of things about him culturally, but people will remember, for example, that he had six wives. Like, okay, like that's, that's, that's a memorable thing. And in fact, the book uh, that Seller and Yateman wrote, 1066 and all that, was premised on the assumption that people just remember the highlights. And so, so I, I can't remember exactly the subtitle of the book, but it's something like everything that you can remember. <laughs> and... And it's very funny because, because it, it does document only those things that people can clearly call to mind. I mean, if you happen to be a um, British citizen, tell me about Henry IV. <gasps> now, he's a very important king, um, but you're not going to immediately like spring to mind who he is. Um, I can tell you that, that uh, he was the antagonist of Richard II and that he uh, initiated um, the Wars of the Roses and so on. I, you know, like I can dredge it up myself, but that's because I'm a historian. But I, I would guarantee that the vast majority of people go and walk on the street somewhere in, in England and say, excuse me, can you, can you tell me some uh, highlights of the reign of Henry IV? Not a clue. What about the highlights of Queen Victoria's reign? Well, that's probably going to be a little easier. Um, they might remember that, that she was uh, famously in love with um, Prince Albert, had a lot of children, um, was famous as a widow, um, spent a lot of time isolated and wearing black in, in Windsor Castle. How about the first Queen Elizabeth? 
Mm. Red hair, uh, never got married, the virgin queen. You know, I mean, like, but it, what does the cultural memory look like? That's one of the things that I'm trying to uncover in this book. It's like, it's not, it's not individual memory. It's, it's group memory. It's what, it's what is generally recognized so that if, for example, I'm at a dinner party and I, and I just happen to think about Henry VIII and I want to say something, what can I say that culturally will be that people will recognize and say, oh yeah, he was, like, <laughs> he was fat. <laughs> he wasn't always fat, but he was certainly fat in, in a lot of the uh, portraits. Or, I don't know about fat, that maybe is a bit um, uh, judgmental, I mean, like, but large. Uh, uh, um, uh, definitely stout. Um, uh, bearded. Um, uh, you know, the kinds of things that, that pretty much everybody within the culture will recognize. So can we think of a culture as being like an individual that is, it is a, that is defined as a collection of its memories? Well, that's an interesting point, and it's something that I'm going to pursue. Um, what is your memory like? Are you a collection of memories? Is that who you are? Is that how we can define you? Certainly something that comes up in therapy all the time when people um, are interested in changing themselves. They need, they need to, not, it's not so much they need to change their memories, they need to change the impact of those memories on their present lives. They need to reinterpret or reframe those memories so that they respond to them in different ways. All right, well, that's memory for today. And of course, one of my long-term uh, aspects of memory is all of my videos. I think this is number 250. So that means that I've been doing this now for a very long time. Um, and I have in all of them some form of memory. It, it's a, a bank of memories. So if you like these memories, Please like, right? press the like button, subscribe, and I'll see you on Friday. Have a good week.